thank you all so much for being out here, coming to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly meeting. What we're working for is healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and an abundance of native fish throughout the, whole, uh, the islands of Maui Nui. Some of the projects that most of you, I think, are familiar with, and thank you to everyone who's new tonight as well, is our Ocean Water Quality Program, which we co-manage with the Nature Conservancy um, and with West Maui Ridge to Reef. So we're currently monitoring 41 different waters, 41 different sites throughout South and West Maui for various different levels of um, water quality parameters. And we're in partnership with the State of Hawaii Department of Clean Water Branch, and these are some of our amazing sponsors that help make that program possible. So as you'll be hearing more about tonight, one of our other major programs is working to improve water quality in Ma'alaya Bay through the Oyster Project, which should be moving forward soon, and Amy will be sharing a lot more with you about that. That again will also be a citizen science-based volunteer project, so we look forward to seeing some of you out there to help us with that in the future. We also work to support uh, the community managed Makai areas through the Maui Nui Marine, <laughs> Maui Nui Makai Network, more MNMNs. And we work with groups uh, throughout Maui Nui that are working on community managed areas for their fisheries and looking at local management of those fishery areas. We also have our outreach and education campaigns, the Get a Jump on Protecting Maui's Coral Reefs, Making That Sunscreen Switch. We'll be doing some displays in the airport to help educate our visitors and coral, new coral signs to help people understand when they're at the beach the coral are alive. So if you want to learn more and get involved, please go to MauiReefs.org. You can follow us on our, on our social media at Facebook, Maui New Marine Resource Council, on Twitter, on Instagram, and our email is there as well. I just want to give a shout out to our funders, the Mar Mayor's Office of Economic Development in Maui County, the Marine Institute at the Maui Ocean Center, especially the Maui Ocean Center here for allowing us to use this space each month. We really appreciate that. Akaku for filming us and uh, the Maui Vis Visitors Bureau as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Amy. So I'm Michael Reyes uh, with Maui Environmental Consulting and uh, Wes and I um, worked on the Poakea a stormwater management plan um, for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Um, and basically, what we want to do is um, look at the landscape um, and look for any uh, conditions that were affecting or potentially affecting water quality within Ma'alai Bay. And so we, the study focused on um, erosion and sediment transport um, that would be caused by stormwater events. Um, we also looked for observations of nutrient or pathogen or other pollution sources um, on the landscape. Um, and so this is uh, the Pohokea watershed. Um, it um, starts at approximately 4,600 feet at the summit of uh, the West Maui Mountains. Um, and then along the coastline, it goes from Kalia Pond um, and then all the way past McGregor's Point to uh, Vainui Gulch um, on the west side, on the west coast. Um, this is a quad map of the watershed, um, and it's showing it's, it's about a 5,200 acre uh, watershed. Um, and as you can see, it's quite steep um, at the top, and then as you move towards the, the agricultural lands, um, the slope drops off. So <laughs> there are four major drainage ways within the watershed. Um, the Poakea Gulch obviously being the most prominent. Um, and this gulch um, starts uh, at the summit and continues along moving um, east and, uh, and south. Um, and it it um, deposits into Kalia Pond before ultimately entering into uh, Malai Bay. The next major gulch is Kanayo Gulch, and this one, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, th th this gulch has actually been altered, um, where it used to flow uh, through these agricultural lands and discharge um, kind of by Haycraft Beach. Now it actually <laughs> enters the Wahehe Ditch System um, and discharges um, through the detention basin that's currently being 
uh, repaired uh, before entering into Malaya Bay. The next major gulch is Malaya Gulch. Uh, this one um, crosses under the highway um, and under the Malaya Triangle before entering into uh, Malaya Harbor. And then the last major gulch that we looked at was the Malala Vaiaole Gulch. And I apologize, I'm probably not saying that correctly. Um, but um, this gulch um, starts roughly at about 2,000 feet and then flows parallel kind of with the, uh, the Wind Farm Road, uh, the eastern side of the Wind Farm Road and enters into uh, Motlaya Bay, just east of McGregor's Point. Um, and, and all this information is basically to um, give you guys uh, a characterization of the watershed. Um, and then I'll move into some of the pollution sources that we observed, and then I'll discuss some um, implementation projects that we think will, will help address uh, those pollution sources. One other um, major uh, drainage way that, uh, that we observed and I wanted to talk about where it was the Wahehe ditch system. Um, there's actually what we're referring to uh, on all the, all the reference um, data that we found both are referred to as the Wahehe ditch so we called them Wahehe ditch Malka and Mackay. Um, these ditches, this ditch actually comes all the way around starting from Wahehe, um, comes through here and where it enters uh, the Pokea watershed is um, by the Kahili Golf Course. Um, and then the other, uh, the Makai Wahehe Ditch actually runs through agricultural lands um, and discharges right along the road that's associated with um, Haole Street. I wanted to really key in on these discharge pathways um, because the Wahehe Gulch and then the Pokea Gulch um, you know, they cross underneath uh, Honopilani Highway. Um, they continue on through Ag Land. They, they kind of cross right behind Miko Power Plant and then go into the Kaelia Pond. Um, and it, it's kind of important to understand where these different systems are going. And so we, we tried to record, um, you know, all the locations of culverts um, and then where all these different systems are discharging because obviously during stormwater events, we wanted to understand, um, w you know, what systems are impacting um, what locations within the watershed and within coastal uh, coastal waters. Um, as far as marine environments, um, there are tracts of coral reef uh, west of McGregor's Point and then you know, like east of uh, Haycraft Beach, uh, with smaller outcroppings of coral. Um, the benthic habitat is based, uh, mostly pavement or exposed rock, horizontal with the seafloor. The next thing we wanted to look at um, was the land use districts within Pohokea. Um, and so there, there are three, uh, the largest being uh, conservation land, the, the second uh, being uh, agricultural land, and then obviously there's the urban corridor uh, along, along the ocean. As far as land use classifications, uh, this. These land use classifications, they're generally aerially delineated, and so they may not be entirely accurate. Um, and so as an example, evergreen forest land, um, you know, that's probably because of like invasive ironwoods growing in this area. But uh, it, it was interesting to see that, you know, mixed rangeland is obviously the, the largest portion uh, of the land use classification. And then as far as soils, in the report we go into much more detail, but basically what I wanted to emphasize was that at higher altitudes um, and within much of the conservation land, you know, associated with uh, the wind farm, um, these, these areas are, have a high runoff potential. And so if you could imagine um, during a rain event, um, there's, you know, any, any stormwater um, is not really infiltrating into the soil, but basically hitting uh, like a hard hard pan uh, blue rock, um, and is then moving downstream. Um, and so you can see over in the agricultural lands, you have areas with soil which are a much higher infiltration rate. So I'm going to move into the potential sources of pollution that Wes and I observed. And uh, this is Wes Crow. He's sitting in the front row. Uh, yeah, go ahead and wave, Wes. 
but he's in this, he's the guy with the floppy hat throughout the rest of the presentation. I chose this picture to start like the potential sources of pollution because we uh, weren't expecting to find this, but uh, these are uh, head cuts um, just Malka of Hono Pilani Highway, uh, and there were several. I'd say this is probably the worst, but you can see the extent. Um, Wes, what are you, like 6'2"? Basically what's happening is that during stormwater events, um, water is flowing down these gulches and, and backing up at the culverts under Hono Pilani Highway, and that water is becoming like um, almost like a wash cycle, um, and it's moving back up the stream channel and eroding um, these, these stream channels and, and actually causing a source of um, sediment pollution. Um, so what we did was, you know, we, we went out for three full days um, throughout the Pokeh watershed. Um, we canvassed uh, the area. We identified and photo documented sources of sediment with high, uh, or areas with high erosion potential. Um, you know, we looked at uh, head cuts, bare ground rills, channels on the soil surface, um, any failed um, infrastructure, and any outdated uh, or uh, improper land management strategies. Uh, I, I kind of broke this up into conservation land, observations, agriculture observations, and then urban corridor observations of um, sources of pollution. And so um, in the conservation lands, this, this first slide is uh, unimproved roads. And so there are uh, quite a few unimproved roads associated with the conservation lands. Um, and as you can see from the picture, um, we have some, some pretty serious uh, rills um, or channelization um, caused from erosion um, in these areas. And um, the problem is that these, these roads, they end up becoming um, basically little conduits um, for uh, sediment and erosion. In addition to the the, un the old roads, we have uh, the the transmission and, and distribution, like maintenance roads, basically. Um, and these are you can see the same thing where uh, you have evidence of severe erosion from these areas. Up at like very high altitude, uh, at the very top of the conservation lands, we were, were observing landslides. Uh, we believe that. Uh, that the native scrub habitat is being lost um, from invasive plant species. Uh, and then what's occurring is basically during rain events, that top layer of soil is basically being stripped away um, and all that's left below is, is the hard pan. And so this is, I mean, this is a, um, a good picture of, of the type of uh, soil loss that we observed um, at, at high, high altitudes in the uh, conservation land. I had already discussed head cuts, uh, but you know, I, you can see how severe this is. It's actually an old fence going across the top here. With, with West down below, this is him standing inside one of the gulches. The, I believe the next picture, yeah, you can see the highway, Hono Pilani Highway is there. We're all sitting in this dome right now. Um, so next time you're driving along the highway, if you look Malka of the highway, you'll start to realize it almost looks like bombs went off. There's these huge uh, cavities, milk of the highway. Those are the head cuts uh, associated with these gulches. Within the, the mid-level agricultural lands, um, we, I'd mentioned the Waihehe ditches. The, the Malka Waihehe ditch um, flows off of um, the golf course and it enters into Poakea Gulch. And this is the confluence. And as you can see, we have evidence of fire. There's not a lot of... Um, vegetation, ground vegetation. Um, you can see, you know, all this is invasive. I believe this is all halicoa uh, coming back after a fire event. Uh, and you can see evidence of erosion everywhere entering. This is, this is the, um, the actual gully here, or the Wahei Ditch, um, the confluence of that with Pokea Gulch. And so the evidence of erosion uh, was, was very evident. Uh, the Makai Wahehe Ditch um, is an armored, uh, you know, concrete-lined armored ditch uh, that runs parallel to the highway. Um, you know, this ditch is 
A, full of trash and ultimately runs directly into the ocean. Uh, and so uh, we, we certainly thought that um, it was an issue. It also, this ditch is used to bisect uh, or cut off uh, Kanayo Gulch. Again, uh, fire breaks and, and power line corridors uh, within the mid-level agricultural lands. We, we observed um, you know, a lot of erosion uh, as well. Um, again, these act as conduits for uh, sediment. With the stream diversion that I was talking about, this is Wahei Gulch, and, and that's where um, Kanayo Gulch is clipped, and then it's rerouted along the gulch, and then discharges over here. Um, so within the commercial and urban land, um, I'm sure we're all familiar with these parking lots, but we have these you know dirt and gravel parking lots, um, and there's nothing really keeping this dirt um, on a windy day um, or during a the large storm event for flowing directly into the harbor. Likewise, we have you know stormwater infrastructure, um, but unfortunately, you know it's going directly out into the harbor. So you have you know cars uh, all throughout Motley Triangle, um, and this could be a source of oil and grease, uh, trash, um, and you know sediment, other things that ends up directly in the harbor. And then uh, down Haoli Street. Um, we actually have um, several uh, sources of pollution that we observed. Um, these were everything from like um, car washing stations to pool, uh, backwash, uh, and clean out areas. Um, and so we thought that these could be addressed as well. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about some management projects and strategies that Wes and I had suggested for the area. I, I put this picture up. I know that um, this detention basin is being repaired currently, um, but I w really wanted to, with all of the um, strategies that, that I'm going to be proposing, I wanted to emphasize that you know this area is very dry. For, for years at a time, it may not see uh, surface water flow, um, but when it does flow, there's a high potential for uh, very extreme you know, flash flood type events. And so any infrastructure um, or any projects that that um, we implement um, need to we need to always uh, keep in mind that they need to be engineered to handle high flow uh, stormwater events within the conservation lands. And I'm just going to kind of like move through with these uh, projects, you know, from conservation back down into the urban corridor. Um, so within the unimproved roads, um, we should kind of you know take a um, figure out which ones are redundant or which ones are unnecessary and decommission these roads. Um, we could also, uh, you know, regrade them if, if they are needed um, so that, you know, we don't get all these uh, channels and, and rills and all this loss of sediment. Um, old roads could also be repurposed as fire breaks. Next we have wildfires and obviously we all know uh, that this area has extreme uh, fire. Uh, we just recently had a huge fire. Um, it seems like every year we're having fires. Um, and so existing fire breaks need to be maintained and new fire breaks need to be established throughout the watershed and, and, and de certainly in the, um, you know, the Malco conservation lands. Um, and then ve vegetation should be maintained to reduce fuel loads. Um, and, and, you know, fire resistant vegetation, ideally native vegetation, should be planted uh, whenever possible. And then after fires, uh, there needs to be a real restoration effort coordinated to uh, quickly stabilize that uh, topsoil so that we don't lose it in the next rain event. Further studies of the overall e ecological response of the plant communities and vegetation should be done just to kind of see like how is it responding to all these fires that are, are constantly sweeping across the landscape. Specific to power lines, um, you know, working with stakeholders to kind of address vegetation that's close to power lines, um, any disused or inactive corridors or corridors that obviously need maintenance. Um, all of these things should be uh, addressed. Um, and then ideally we could do underground uh, utilities, which I, you know, I would I think benefit uh, the area. So as far as the landslides are concerned, uh, we looked at um, you know, basically planting um, these 
these terraced areas to to minimize or um, st stop landslides from occurring. So this is actually a depiction of the t types of uh, t terraced uh, vegetation that you could do. This is actually uh, work that Wes you did on the west side. Is that right? This, this is all vetiver planted, and basically as um, water flows towards the gulch, uh, stormwater, any sediment um, that's in that stormwater is held in place by uh, these rows of vetiver. So for the head cuts, um, a couple of things. We wanted to monitor the head cuts to see if after these large storm events, to, to really see how big uh, they're getting. And so the way we would do that it would be to basically put uh, rebar um, transects um, at various locations um, at the um, extent of the head cut. Mm -hmm. And that way you could, after a large storm event, come back and see, you know, did you lose, you know, two feet of, uh, of your edge? Like, is there now a uh, rebar sticking out in space? And, and in this way you could kind of, um, you know, by taking measurements of the height and then the amount of um, sediment lost, you could kind of um, quantify the growth of that uh, head cut. Um, and then to stabilize these areas, um, you can put in like large rocks, basically riprap, um, or, you know, kind of slow water upstream. Um, so you'd be like basically putting rock up here um, to, to slow that water as it approaches the head cut. Um, and, and so there, there are several other methods for addressing head cuts. Uh, it is large, I mean, it's a large earth moving uh, project. Right, so within the Wahehe Makai ditch system, um, you can see all the trash. All this trash ends up right in the ocean. Um, and so I know that Maui Nui Marine Resource Council did a cleanup, correct? Um, so we, we think that if we could get groups to, um, on a regular basis, come out and do uh, this cleanup, it's like, I think we, we said, you know, do this roadside cleanup or a beach cleanup, all the, it's all the same, right? It's, it's going to end up right in the ocean. Within the Waihehe Malka ditch system, um, we, all of this sediment actually ended up on the highway after a large storm event. And I, I want to say that was like three years ago. Um, but similar to uh, the, the dirt roads in the conservation land, um, these areas either need to be decommissioned and replanted with native vegetation or vetiver or something like that, or they need to be um, recontoured and cleaned out so that they don't have such high erosion potential. Um, power line corridors in the agricultural lands. This is not a good picture, but this is actually Pohokea Gulch running parallel to the transmission corridor. Um, and this is a road that crosses it. And so um, there's a high potential during stormwater, large stormwater events for Poké Gulch to undermine these, um, these power poles. And we talked to some MECO employees that were saying that that had actually been the case in the past where um, the gulch had gotten so big that it had kind of popped its banks and started to undermine these power poles. So we were thinking it may be beneficial to move power lines um, to go through agricultural lands not and not be associated with um, the gulches. And this is kind of a picture of the, the power line infrastructure. Um, I should have put the gulch layer on here too, but you can kind of see Pokeh Gulch comes uh, down this way and it meets up with the power line corridor here, it goes right to the, the Miko power plant. And so you can, you can see how, um, I, I believe it's this transmission cor corridor um, is associated right with the, the Pohokea Gulch. So with mid-level agricultural lands, we have the Kahili Golf Course, and even though it's kind of just on the edge of the watershed, um, we figured it was an opportunity. Golf courses typically have, uh, using nutrients to keep their greens green. Um, and so one way of cleaning that water as it leaves their site is to uh, insert a nutrient curtain. Uh, this curtain uh, is basically a, 
a layer of biochar, and as uh, water, nutrient-laden water, runs across that, um, if you can imagine, think of it as like a large buried filter of, of biochar, um, it, it, that water is cleaned as it, as it moves through that system. Um, it's a very elementary uh, description of what a uh, nutrient curtain is, but they're actually fairly inexpensive, and uh, Wes has installed them over on the west side working with Tova Calendar uh, with Ridge to Reef. So also within the Keeley Golf Course for all the ponds, um, there's these floating treatment wetlands and uh, basically these, these are just floating plants um, that are absorbing nutrients out of the water and then also supplying habitat for, for uh, bacteria which um, remove, they actually um, transfer nitrogen into um, but it's aerobic nitrogen, correct? Yeah, atmospheric. yeah, atmospheric nitrogen, thank you. So within the fallow pastures uh, and the proposed Spencer Homes Ag Agricultural Subdivision, which is, is, is this area here, um, we thought that there was a real opportunity for a lot of cool projects. And so keep in mind, you know, we have this very steep, um, low permeability uh, area here and then as you enter into, you know, this is kind of like the middle ground in between the, the agricultural land over here. Um, and because most of our, our gulches flow right through this area, uh, we thought it was a great opportunity to do some, um, some projects. And so um, one of them would be like a multi-pond system. And the way that this works is water coming down a gulch would enter into one pond before you know, entering into the next. Um, it slows water long enough for sediment to fall out of suspension. Some of these areas, because it rains um, so infrequently, well, when it does rain, you have the opportunity, for, especially with smaller storm events, to capture quite a bit of the sediment coming off the landscape. This is another example of uh, detention basins in series. This was proposed um, over for the west side for Waiakuli. Um, and so here you have the stream going off and um, kind of perpendicular to the stream you have um, the, you know, these contoured swales essentially that enter into um, a detention basin and then those detention basins kind of pop off onto one another and this is a, another way of, of slowing water and capturing sediment before it enters into the ocean. Uh, and then we have large uh, single detention basins. Um, these are great because they can be multi-use. They can be parks. This can be, you know, a dog park, a soccer field. Um, in fact, I, I think I even put um, oh yeah, the Saturday swap meet at the Maui College is a great example of a large detention basin. Um, that during stormwater events, it fills up with um, with water, but because this area is so dry, during most of the year, it would just be used as green space. So then, um, another. Um, option would be dry wells. So instead of water running through these gulches and discharging into the ocean, um, you capture some of that water and send it down into the aquifer. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you can have filters around this um, so that they don't fill with sediment uh, and, you know, to keep the water entering into the ground uh, clean. Uh, for the, the, in the commercial and urban areas, uh, you know, for the dirt parking lots, um, we said that these could definitely be improved, um, revegetated or uh, um, restored if possible, if feasible. Um, if not, they should be uh, improved with gravel and LID infrastructure, um, pervious pavers, you know, anything besides just bare, <laughs> bare ground. Um, and so within the Mylia Triangle parking lot, um, we also identified um, several LID projects that could benefit the parking lot. Um, you know, curb cuts, basically, you have during a stormwater event. Stormwater, uh, instead of going into the ocean, goes into your planters um, and infiltrates back into the ground. Uh, same thing with, the, with this uh, like pervious pavement or pavers. Um, you actually have um, the ability to, during a rain event, have uh, stormwater enter back into the ground instead of being directed through stormwater infrastructure into the ocean. Amy's going to talk more about the oyster 
project. Uh, I'm not going to um, say too much about it, except that oysters are great at uh, pumping large volumes of water, um, and they're able to remove all kinds of uh, pollutants and impurities from the water. This is actually a list of all the different uh, projects that, that we had proposed, and then we gave them a priority level. Um, th these were not all included today. Um, they're all in the report. Um, and I'm sure you, you can look over it at, at your leisure. Um, but the last thing we did was uh, propose a water quality monitoring program. Amy is going to talk about the current water quality monitoring program. This is just what we had proposed when we, um, when we provided the plan. Um, and so what we, it had been at the time that um, hey, DOH was just monitoring at Haycraft Beach. Um, and you know, water quality standards are not being met for various parameters. Um, and so what, what we had done was um, we had proposed a water quality monitoring plan. And what we wanted to do was to get an idea of, of both groundwater, um, stormwater, and surface water in the harbor and in the bay. Um, because we, you know, we're not, at this time we don't really know if it's, if we have pollutants coming off of agricultural land through groundwater, um, if we have just a ton of pollution uh, occurring because of stormwater events, um, or, or, or what exactly is going on. And so we have proposed pisometers, which are essentially just wells, um, be placed um, along the highway and then also at various locations, um, you know, Kalia Pond, um, along uh, uh, the, the condo road, um, and, and in this way we could actually monitor groundwater elevation. Um, after rainfall events, we could see if groundwater is rising. Uh, we could also take samples from that groundwater uh, to see how it changes um, day to day or month to month. Um, and then we also had a lot of surface sampling locations. Some of them would only be sampled after storm events, and those are typically sites that are associated with gulches. Um, and then we had other sites that were out in Motley Bay and Motley Harbor um, that could be sampled uh, with, uh, a, uh, with a normal frequency. And so the parameters that we really were interested in were um, the in, in situ sampling parameters were temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, pH, and turbidity. Those are all just very standard uh, in situ sampling parameters. Uh, but then we also wanted to look at total nitrogen, total phosphorus, orthophosphates, nitrate, nitrite, uh, ammonia nitrogen, and then total suspended solids, uh, because we are interested in, uh, you know, obviously nutrients uh, as well um, as sediment. That's, that's all I have. I don't know how fast or how slow that was, but um, I wanted to thank uh, Maui New Marine Resource Council and the Maui Ocean Center for, for allowing us to be here tonight, and of course, uh, Wes, for, for uh, doing this pr uh, plan with me. So, any questions? Aloha. Aloha. Oh, thanks guys. I'm Amy Hodges uh, with the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, oh, let me pull up my guy here. Um, I'm just going to do, now that you heard all about the awesome Poakea Watershed Stormwater Management Plan and Water Quality Monitoring Plan that, uh, that, that, that Michael and Wesley put together for us, all these great projects, a menu of things to implement, um, what do we do, how do we implement them, where do we start, the priority list was great, um, but we had to go out and get funding for them. And I know that I've touched on a few of these projects before with some of your familiar faces here, but I'm just gonna highlight a fire, because I know that's what we're all here to hear about, um, but also, the projects that we currently have funding for and are implementing like tomorrow um, and in the next year or so, just so you know what we're doing, um, a lot of it has to do with fire. So this must look familiar to many of you. This was October, first week of October this year. Um, the fire in Mount Laya happened the exact week that I was off island, unfortunately, so I didn't get to witness it. Um, but thank you, John Starmer, who captured some images for us. So I'm sorry for those of you who live in the area and had to live through this. Um, it, was a, it was a big one. Um, 
and unfortunately not uncommon for this area. Here's another one. Whew. There's a little of the aftermath, the, the smoking. And there it is again. And I think the total was 4,100 acres in those couple days that happened. Um, and the question is why and what can we do about it? Um, Michael hit on a bunch of things that we can do about it. And unfortunately, you know, I have talked with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife who are the first responders. They're wonderful um, in firefighting, especially in rough terrain like this. And they support the Maui Fire Department, who we love as well. Um, and a lot of the times, we just don't know the culprit, what it is. There's not statistics on it. We have our suspicions, but it would take somebody going out, unless it's captured on film, unless somebody is there to witness it, you know, you're stuck with 4,100 acres to walk and try and find a spark of a fire. It's really difficult. Um, so we have our suspicions, and the best way to go about fixing it is to just blast all of the potential problems and go for it. Things that we don't have on Maui so much as that the mainland has to deal with is uh, lightning sources. You know, it's, it's rare that we get the lightning source. A fire start here, um, that's a natural one. Other things would be like, I think there's like spontaneous combustion of leaf litter in really hot conditions and places. We don't really get that as much here. Um, the odd dragon, you know, wherever you go, not so much on Maui. <laughs> Fire is caused by humans on Maui, a human source one way or another, and which means it's avoidable. We can do something about it. Um, so here we got, yeah, here we got, uh, you know, our infrastructure lines, we've got campfires going, uh, we've got our off-road vehicles or equ heavy equipment sparking, we love our fireworks here. Um, this is like leaf litter, garbage burning, cigarettes, you know, I learned a fun stat the other day that it's really, like a really, really low percent of cigarettes started fire, like 1% or something. The, the way cigarettes are made these days, it's not an issue. So that's an easy one to point fingers at, but not the main source. And arson, which I think we hear about in the news as potential sources here. And again, sometimes that's confirmed and sometimes we don't know. Um, so we're looking at these sources, human causes, um, are the main, main culprit, we think. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. It's a nonprofit. Um, I think it's nonprofit. <laughs> they're based on Big Island, but they're wonderful. They go to all the islands. They do a lot of wonderful research on fire prevention, fire cause, vegetation management strategies, what the community thinks. Um, and I want to shout out to them because I tore the next two maps directly from their website today. And you should go um, to their website as well if you want to learn about fire causes. It's amazing. So it's right there, hawaiiwildfire.org. This is their Maui report. It just came out, I don't know, it came to my email inbox like a month ago or less. Um, and it's available on their website. And here's one of the maps. So this is Maui fire history. And I didn't write this. They highlighted it already in their report right here. The Ma'alai, area prone to fire, weather conditions, dry, windy, hot. Well, we know that. Um, and if you look again, this is just from 2002 to 2012. It's just 10 years. There is more data out there, and there's more recent data. It's just not released yet. But if you have a friend that works for the organization or you call them up, they might let you know. Um, you can just imagine that it's bigger, badder fire in the past few years, which is what we've seen. What they did is the uh, HWMO, and I don't want to give a report on their report. That's their organization. <laughs> but I did just want to, I thought this was interesting that Ma'alaya got highlighted in a meeting they had on Maui last year. Um, to put this report together. And they had a bunch of people come together and say, where are you worried about? Why are you worried about it in regards to fire? And they highlighted areas of concern, which were basically where people live, the highest density of people, where there's natural resources that need protection or cultural resources that need protection. And Ma'alaya popped up like as high as Lahaina on there in people's opinion of areas of concern. 
which is interesting because there's not like a huge population of people living here compared to like Wailuku and Kahului or Kihei. Um, but it's an area of concern because you know, you got the highway, it's a main exit point, you've got our infrastructure, our power comes from there, you've got a major harbor, you've got, you know, you got the windmills, you got Miko here, you've got a beautiful native forest that's being protected by the Monokahalafai watershed partnership up above. Um, and it's just that access point here for people coming to and from, tourists, locals, whoever. So Ma'alaya, rating high on areas concerns. So that's that's interesting. So why do we care about fire, right? We care about fish, abundance of fish, clean water. You guys all know this, I'm preaching the choir here, but fire, vegetation loss, leads to erosion, poor water quality, coral loss. So we went out and got funding. That's, I'm coming back to it. We went out and got funding to implement some of the projects in Michael and Wes's plan. We got funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, thank you, Hawaii Tourism Authority, thank you, and the Mayor's Office of Economic Development from the county. So now we can start implementing some of these projects, fire breaks, vegetation plantings, head cut monitoring, water quality monitoring, and the oysters. So I'm just gonna highlight each of those real quick. Fuel and fire breaks. I put this map together with um, the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Again, they're wonderful, and they are the state and the Pohakea parcel that Michael was talking about is like basically this here ish. And this chunk of it here is owned by the state. It's unencumbered land in the land division. So we're working with the state if we want to work in that area. And they're on board and they're very much in support of improved management practices in this area. So we'd be working closely with them. And we put this together. This is uh, an example of fuel and fire breaks in the area. So we've got the green road there. That's your highway and that dirt road that goes along the Spencer property. If you're doing the poly trail, you kind of cross over it. The red road straight up, your windmill road. Blue road zigzagging down is your Miko access road for the power lines. And the purple one cutting across is the poly trail. The hiking trail. And then we've got the big yellow lines are the power lines, just you can ignore those for now. <laughs> but the other colors in there are all existing roads, unimproved roads, current access roads, one or the other, that are great potential sources of fuel and fire breaks and being used for that purpose now but could need some more love. <laughs> so we're looking at these and what they do is they kind of, or they do, border the parcel of land, the state parcel here, and this is what we're looking at for improving fire breaks, which is taking all the vegetation down to bare soil, and fuel breaks, which is just like cutting back the vegetation and maintaining it. So we're looking at putting fire breaks or improving the existing roads here to be better fire breaks along here, and then buffers of fuel breaks on either side of up to 30 feet where, you know, where the conditions allow. Um, and that should allow for to slow the fires, prevent them from jumping as much, and allow for our firefighters to have safer access to fight the fires. So that's the fire break section. Uh, doo -doo. The next one is strategic plantings. When I get, I get scared when I say I'm gonna take something all the way down to bare ground, because I'm a water person. That makes me think of erosion. I don't like it. I'm usually pro-vegetation. But in this watershed, we can't just go in and be like, let's plant koa trees everywhere. Like, that's just not going to work. There's no water. Um, and it's just, you're just adding fuel to the fire, literally, in that area. So we're looking at doing strategic plantings to help prevent erosion along the roads, like Michael showed of Wes's project, which is coming up right here in Wahikuli. Oh, not that one. But <laughs> this one. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. He's like my Yoda. <laughs> Um, a vetiver, but uh, this is in Wahikuli, and using vetiver um, as a great plant to help slow erosion in the area. There it is. Oh, there we go, Coral Reef Alliance Wahikuli project. So that would be a volunteer opportunity, strategically planting just where we think erosion hotspots are. Maybe that's along the roads that Michael said that are you know, be, need to be decommissioned. The roads that aren't in use anymore, they're not access roads, they're not ag area anymore. 
let's do some plantings on them so they're not highways for sedimentation. Oh, this is a really cool photo. I just want to show I'm standing over the line of vetiver there. This stuff is so awesome. You plant it in, it acts like, it's almost like whale baleen, just filters. So this is my one foot, and it's like, if you could see my knee, my knee's bent at like a 45 or 90 degree angle here. It's, and this foot's all the way down, and it's just captured all the sediment that's flowing. And it would have gone right out into a gulch. It was really cool. Thank you, Wesley. <laughs> I'm not going to say more about vetiver, because I think we got a couple experts in the room. So if we have vetiver questions, we can come back to it. <laughs> to those guys. There's the head cup monitoring. Thank you, we did get some funding for that. I know Michael talked about it, so hopefully we are not fully funded, but we're gonna try and get there, do that rebar installation to monitor head cuts and uh, quantify sediment loads, or, or sediment loss at least. Uh, there it is. There's our guy. <laughs> I already touched on that, so I'll skip over it. There's the same map that Michael showed you from the plan. There's our culvert drainages. So with all this um, sediment that's coming down after the fire, it's going through these gulches. Here's one half of like the Malka side of the gulch, and there's the Mackay side emptying right into the harbor. So this is right next to the boat ramp at the harbor. The picture doesn't do it justice, but if you've walked around in the water like I have, it's about knee to thigh deep of loose puffy sediment under that water there. Um, of course, that is a poor circulation spot, so I'll give it a little credit. But the water quality is poor, so we did get some funding for water quality monitoring from the plan, and most of these sites are directly from the plan. We'll be doing these. We have the Julio Caviola Water Quality Monitoring Program already underway, the 41 sites, like Christina was saying, on Leeward Maui. So they took over. They've been doing Haycraft for a little bit, but just starting in July, they took on two more sites. They took on Ma'alaya Condos, is what we're calling it, just because it's in the middle of the condos. But it's right at the, um, the drainage point of that diversion where that retention basin is being fixed. So they're monitoring there every three weeks. And then at the harbor mouth as well, just because it was a little more representative of true coastal waters. So every three weeks. And then MNMRC, independently of the Hui, is, has taken on monitoring at all these other sites about every two to three weeks um, right now just to see what we see. We don't know. We don't know the water condition at all these sites. So we're doing all the parameters, nutrients, in situ, um, at those sites. And it doesn't mean that we'll continue all of these white spots forever, but we just don't, we don't know what we don't know yet. So we've started over the past few months just collecting here, we'll probably decrease these over time. Maybe not. Maybe they're really awesome. Maybe we keep going. And one of the last things is, um, in addition to nutrient sampling, we're taking our, our little beast, our vessel out into the harbor and doing transects. This is our fancy water quality probe that we got through a donation from Lush Cosmetics last year. And we've got our probe that does continuous in-water monitoring. We've got some homemade current drifters here. We've been doing some snorkeling. We take our kayak vessel out, and we do transects around the harbor. Um, shout out to John Starmer, who actually is here tonight. Where are you, John? There he is. He's our, our special scientist uh, expert that helps us with our water quality in the harbor. So here's us just paddling around, and the probe is actually tied to the front, the bow, and John watches that, and I'm supposed to be paddling in the back, but I'm really just filming things and hanging out, but the kayak goes much straighter when I'm not involved, um, so, not a steersman. Um, <laughs> this is what it looks like. This is one of the examples of our probe readings, and actually, um, John, do you want to say anything? We've only been doing it for a few months. We don't have baseline data yet from our probe. And our nutrient samples go to the lab, and it's a turnaround, so we don't have those yet. But any highlights from the harbor monitoring you'd like to point out? So you, as you might expect it, if you're at all familiar with the, the harbor, you've got uh, kind of the little beach that tends to be murky regardless uh, and just 
uh, is probably being churned up by swells continuously. I don't know necessarily that it's getting continuous uh, input of sediment. Uh, and then over by the ramp is just, uh, if you've ever put your foot down in there, as Amy has, um, really light sediment. And again, I think boats coming through and any sort of uh, disturbance just churns that up. Um, so no big surprises. However, we are seeing that uh, we, we've been doing this primarily to get uh, an initial idea of what the harbor is like before the oysters are going in. So this is kind of a before and we'll continue monitoring to see after just to see are the oysters doing anything. Um, as Amy said, nutrient wise we're not too sure about uh, you know any hot spots or anything that we'd be concerned about. What is interesting that's not showed here is that there do seem to be a couple of areas where fresh water is coming in um, and we don't have uh, nutrient data to map to that yet to see whether that's a nutrient pollutant source or whether uh, it's just a naturally occurring sort of thing that's not of concern. Uh, but as Amy said, the stuff we've done so far, we've just been doing it for a few months and we're really trying to get a sense of what's going on in the harbor. Um, is water quality variation that we're seeing something to be concerned about or is it just nature doing what nature does? Uh, yeah, I guess that's... Thanks, John. So um, we were just talking and we were saying that we'd like to shoot for the January meeting to be maybe the first um, gathering of data from our Malai Harbor water quality monitoring. Again, it wouldn't be a baseline. It would only be like the first six months of data. You know, it doesn't reflect all the seasons, but start putting together um, some pieces there. Uh, the other thing we have, just thought I'd mention, because they're fun, is we have these current drifters, again, to try to get an idea of the flow of the currents within the harbor, um, how are things moving around. These things are really cool. Um, this one's called Stumpy. We named them after our pets. We have two. Um, so this is Stumpy. She's mine. And John has Shelby? Shelby. Um, and they're easy to build. And right here is a little GPS unit mounted on them, and they're, they are they flow, I'll show you here, underwater. Most of them is underwater to catch the, the current drift. You know, you don't want the wind to have too much impact on them. So they have like these underwater sails. And I was just gonna say, if anybody's interested, I talked to some people in the HANA community about it. They're very cheap to build. Like my, mine was built out of an old tarp I had. John used an old tent that he had, PVC pipes, and a couple pool noodles slap a GPS on there and put them out there and you've got some tracks of how the currents are moving. Um, probably get permission if you're putting them anywhere. I have to say that. Like we always get the Harbor Master <laughs> permission before deploying them, but we leave them out in the harbor while we're paddling around. Um, and then we have a little track of how the currents are moving. So here's the oysters. Um, I know, I know that we keep saying the oysters are coming, but they really are. I don't want to just be this hype girl up here that it's all like oysters. Um, we're still working through our permits. They are going well. The state's in support. It's just a slow process. So we got our SAP permit, special activities. We almost got our plant quarantine permit, and we're, we almost got our right of entry with the harbor. So those are just a few different government documents that we had to work through to get. But the oyster bioremediation project, oysters, for those of you that haven't heard me before, the oysters are nature's filter. Um, they filter out all these things from the water without even having to be asked. If they're alive, they're filtering and they're cleaning the water. And we got the idea from our waterkeeper friends. O Oahu waterkeeper in the past year now has, I think, four sites of oysters in the water. And that's patterned after the Billion Oyster Project in New York Harbor. If you haven't checked them out, you should They've completely revolutionize the water quality there. And they really will have a billion oysters, I think, by 2035. And also Chesapeake Bay, a huge project there. But anyway, we're going to use some oysters, put them in Ma'alaya Harbor in cages. We're getting them from the Pacific Aquaculture and Coastal Resources Center, PACRIC. They're associated with UH Hilo. The oysters are born here, you know, grew here, not flew here. Um, so they're safe. This is a picture of PACRIC. It's actually, if you look at it, it's an old wastewater reclamation facility that they've turned into an aquaculture facility for the students to learn and do research on bivalves there. It's, it's pretty impressive. Picture of Packrick where our oyster babies are growing. 
and hear a couple of what the oysters might look like. We also have some on the table here. Don't let this fool you, our oysters will not be this big. <laughs> and also, they're not edible, I'm so sorry. Um, more like this size. We're gonna start with the Pacific oyster. It's a non-native, but it is already introduced to the waters here. The ones that we're using actually are triploids, so three sets of chromosomes, so they actually um, are not inclined to reproduce. All they wanna do is grow and get big, um, which is exactly what we want, because the more they're growing, then the more water they're filtering. And that way, they're just a little bit safer. Um, they're not invasive. Triploid Pacific oysters. We're starting with those because they're bigger and better filters than the native species, who we also love and who do exist already in the harbor. And we will be using native species as well. But for the first you know, 500 to 1,000 oysters, we're going to start with the Pacifics just as a pilot. One Pacific oyster filters 50 gallons a day. That's like that many gallons per oyster. They'll be in little cages for their protection. Um, they'll be hung under the docks at the harbor. Um, we'll have maybe six cages to start. Um, the, again, the oysters are toxic because they're filtering out the bad stuff, so please don't harvest them. Definitely don't eat them. Um, yeah, and the cages, it's a volunteer product program. So if you're interested, I know we've got a little list going of volunteers. We're looking at December or January to get started. Um, the cages and the oysters will need to be cleaned like on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, checked for you know, diseases, checked for predators, all that kind of stuff. Um, cages will just need to get have the biofouling cleaned off them. Oh my god, what time is it? Oh my god. And here's some of the dif different species that could be used. Again, we're using the Pacific Here's the native one that's in the harbor right now on the pilings. If you walk out on the catwalks at like a lower tide, you'll see them sticking out or you'll see them on the little mooring balls, evidence of them. They're adorable and um, we love them and we will be using them eventually in combination with the Pacific oyster. Possibly these guys down the road. Don't get, again, not for harvest, not for eating, not for pearls, I'm sorry. Um, but we'll just see, we'll see how it goes, but that's down the road. Um, so yeah, that's the Oyster Project coming up. And I just want to leave you last part. Um, we always talk about we're doing this to clean the water, to help the corals. And I don't know how many of you have actually ever swam in the harbor and looked at the corals there, and they're pretty cool. So meet, meet our corals, guys. We got finger coral in there. These are from a snorkel the other day. And I did get my finger in the picture of the finger coral. So that's good. We got your uh, rice coral and your lace coral, it's a little guy. There's tons of these little teeny lace corals everywhere popping up. And you know, this stuff not looking so hot, but there are some good ones in there. Pretty cool. Another nice rice coral, cauliflower coral, a bunch of, they're all purple in there, purple or white, one or the other. And then I'm gonna leave you with this one. Speaking of that parking lot runoff and blowing of the, the un, of the dirt, the unpaved parking lots. We got a lot of the redness on the side. This is on the side, like right by the Coast Guard building, where I think maybe Pride of Maui pulls up when it's boarding people. This is a little video. Right here. Like choke coral. It's beautiful. Oh, it's a little washed out up there. Uh, I hope you're not getting motion sick. I just stuck my hand in the water as we were paddling through and beautiful coral growing down the side of everything in that harbor. Super hardy. That's us right there. There's the Coast Guard station. You can see it right there. Um, I think that's the last part, but I did want to mention if you guys came to our talk last week, the tribute to corals that was at Yao Theater, they were talking about this weird thing, how you know we hate sedimentation, turbidity in the water, it's bad for coral, but we're in this extreme global warming, hot water situation, and they talk about like a shading effect that the dirt has in the water, and it helps cool it just enough that not all the coral bleaches quite as badly. So it's, 
it's a two-sided coin or whatever the phrase is that, you know, the sedimentation is bad, it prevents, you know, it smothers the coral, it prevents the coral polyps from having a place to land on the hard substrate. At the same time, I don't know, we've got some good corals growing in the harbor. Maybe they're protected just a little bit uh, from the bleaching. I don't know. So TBD. But those are our corals in Motley Harbor. Oops. And now I'm done. Sorry, that went longer. So the, those are our projects that um, we'll be doing in the next year to two years. So now we really will go into Q&A for Michael's presentation and mine. Questions? Uh, before they put in the double box culvert underneath Haoli Street, there were two four-foot pipes that went under there. When we had the flooding of uh, December 2010 and January 2011, they quickly got blocked by debris. And what happened was the water backed up into the cane fields. Those cane fields there were never burned, or they were burned within the last 20 years, so to speak. What happened was is they used a uh, Roundup-type defoliant to kill the cane and then harvest it. Uh, now, with the retention basin and the double box culvert, that water can flow freely, uh, but about a hundred yards upstream of the retention basin is a single four-foot pipe. And that's there for the use of the cane road, the, the interior cane road. That will plug up quickly. The water will go out into that uh, Roundup field, and then it'll come make it way makes it way back into the retention basin, and the sediment will f go down. But at least the water that washes that soil will go into the bay. Have you looked into that four foot culvert or a remedy or a four foot uh, pipe going under that cane rope? No, no. We I'm trying to envision where exactly you're talking about. I know. Um, like as as you're describing that, um, up above the retention basin is like a, um, a very narrow uh, stream channel with like vertical walls uh, that that Wes and I walked. And our concern was you have all of these different um, gulches that are ending up into the Waihehe Makai armored ditch um, that are then being forced through this very narrow um, area and into. Uh, the retention basin and so we're thinking that we have these large volumes of water that are ending up in 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 that retention basin and so it's uh, it's very difficult to um to build that infrastructure to accommodate all of that water now if you're saying that there's a, a you know a, another um location or a location associated with the ag uh, operation that is another cutoff point another bottleneck th absolutely i could see it backing up uh, stormwater into, um, into those agricultural plots. Um, now, we, I don't know, you know what, what pollutants may be in that soil or what they've done in the past that would just take stormwater sampling um, to identify what is actually, what pollutants are coming off of that ag land and, and entering into uh, the harbor. And so, um, you know, that's why they're, uh, they've been implementing the uh, water quality monitoring plan. Um, now, I don't know that, that things like pesticides or herbicides are being sampled for, um, but, but I mean, I take your point that obviously um, when we do have stormwater events, there's the potential for um, pollutants from, you know, from various land uses to enter into, into the ocean. So, I mean, I guess that's the best that I can do to answer, answer your question. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, John. Yeah, I just want to know where we could find a copy of your report. Yeah, it's available on the MyRoots.org website. I think it's both under what we do, and then probably also under the resources tab. MyRoots.org. Hi, um, thank you for doing this work. It's really important work for um, 
those of us who care about water quality. I, my question's for Amy about the oysters. Um, you kind of told us about the beginning of the project, and I'm wondering yeah. where's the end, and do the oysters get harvested? I know they're not for consumption, but they're not. do you ever have to take them out? You, will, you would take them out, yeah, if they passed naturally or from predation. That's part of the reason they're in the cage is for predation, but if one gets in or if one dies naturally, I think the lifespan is about five years for a Pacific, so you would have to remove them um, and dispose of them. And um, then just from their growth, like I'm trying to imagine an oyster reef in the harbor. And yeah, well, again, the ones that we're using um, shouldn't reproduce, shouldn't oh, be reproducing. Right. Okay. Um, and the native ones are already there, already present in the harbor. So um, I don't think that's going to be an issue. But, you know, they are in cages, so we can remove them if that needed to be. Um, with our permit, of course, there's a, a, a monitoring requirement <laughs> that comes with it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we're starting with a small amount for the pilot, just for feasibility to see how it goes with the cages and volunteers and cleaning, just to be fiscally and, and project responsible. Um, but then we will upscale if it's going well, if they're growing, we'll start upscaling the numbers to see if they can impact the water quality. The 500 or 1,000 to start is really just to see how they survive, right? The 500 oysters isn't going to change the water quality in the bay, but once we start upscaling the project, yeah, it really could, in the harbor at least, start cleaning. And then cleaning. The, uh, my question, the yeah. curiosity was, uh, yeah. uh, I was wondering if you had calculated at 50 gallons an oyster, how many how it would many? take to filter the whole I know. harbor. I was just thinking that the other day, I was looking at Google Earth, I'm like, okay, what is the depth of the harbor at average tide? Time? Yeah, um, I don't... I don't have that answer on how many it would take. We'd be looking at thousands, possibly tens of thousands. I don't know if literally there would be... Yeah, we could do it. I mean, I think we could definitely filter out the harbor. Um, it would take thousands, but I think it's doable. There's 100 per cage. That's not that many cages, and there's a lot of docks we can put them under. Um, I think we could do it. If they can clean... I think the Billion Oyster Project, don't quote me on this, somebody go to their website and look it up, but they filter all the water of New York Harbor like every day or every week. It's a staggering how quickly they filter it with the amount of oysters they have. So it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. If they're not reproducing, are they bred in a lab? But yeah. How do you get them to begin with? I know they are. They're bred at the at the Patrick um, Aquaculture Facility, and they have a technique um, for breeding them that way, so that they have three sets of chromosomes. And I would refer you to them for the specifics on that. But they are essentially yeah bred in captivity, and we purchase them from them like at cost. It's a research facility. It's not for profit. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, three years ago, we had. The big burn. The big burn three years ago. It was my understanding, or it was well documented in the news, that the fire department couldn't get to the fire because of a locked gate. And I knew I was dumbfounded by that. The fire department was stopped by that. I thought the fire department had every key, every gate, or a way to get in. Yeah, you know, I can't speak to that. Does anybody know the backstory on a locked gate there? I don't. Um, I would also assume that they have full access to everything, but I don't know that backstory. Them or DOFA, one or the other. Um, do you know? Or Jason Dragowski, do you know? You don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, of DOFA, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the equipment that DOFA has is pretty extreme military grade, caterpillar -y kind of equipment. They are the ones that get up to the super gnarly, peaky places, um, but even they can't get everywhere and they need the helicopters. One of the things that we have talked to a few people about is the need for more like open dip tanks um, for the helicopter access to be closer to fire stuff. ADCA is basically like when the, the stream channel um, is undermined because of erosion and so um, it's, it's, I don't know if you saw the picture, I guess I can pull one up again, but um, 
Basically, if you, if you can imagine the stream backing up and kind of undermining the stream channel above it. So, in this case, it's the streams during a stormwater event are um, slamming into the culverts underneath Hono Pilani Highway, um, and and they're, it's slowed. And so, what's basically happening is it's causing energy to move back up the stream channel. So it's eroding backwards up its stream channel. Um, uh, maybe, let's see, I can find you, let's see if I can find you a good picture. Um, there's the one of the guys standing at the top of a head cut. Oh yeah, this is it. So, like in this instance, you can kind of see, he's standing at the top of a head cut. Like if you could imagine, he's standing kind of at the top of the head cut. If you could imagine, like the stream basically, um, you know, stopped out here and sort of like, like uh, flowing backwards and eroding back up the stream. Any, any other questions? Other projects that he mentioned that you'd love to see implemented? I like the floating wetland and the nutrient curtain would be pretty cool. Groundwater monitoring. Yeah, pisometers are, are uh, fairly expensive, um, and so we would love to be monitoring groundwater. Um, it's, you know, the, the cost to um, install a pisometer can be a little prohibitive. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, we'll be back first Wednesday of every month. See you then. Thank you.